Welcome to today's event on the Kosovo-Serbia Dialogue, What's Next? With the Penn Biden Center's Austin Dollar, Philip Adis, and Nora Weller. We're excited to be partnering with the Penn Biden Center for this great conversation. And thank you all for being with us uh, here today. Josh will be Dollar, who is just wrapping up his time as a visiting scholar with the Penn Biden Center. His research focuses on right-wing nationalism, public corruption, and great power competition. Before joining the Penn Biden Center, he served as an area studies fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis and a research consultant with the International Foundation for Nora Weller, a lawyer and the founding director of the Cambridge Academy of Global Affairs. She has extensive experience in peace negotiations, security sector forum, cultural heritage protection, and has spent lengthy periods of time in the Balkans, Middle East, Cyprus, and South Africa. She's currently researching international policies of heritage protection, looking at special protective zones and the protection of Serb Orthodox monasteries in Kosovo. Our final panelist is Philip Aegis, an associate professor of international security at the University of Belgrade. His most recent book is Crisis and Ontological Insecurity, Serbia's Anxiety Over Kosovo Secession. He is president of the board of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy and co-editor in chief of the Journal of Regional Security. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation. And Austin, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Mike, for that kind introduction. Um, just for a bit of historical context before we jump right in, uh, Kosovo seceded from Serbia in 2008 uh, following a lot of bloody violence in the late 1990s. And for the past several years, the European Union has been really instrumental in trying to normalize relations between Kosovo and Serbia and trying to achieve mutual recognition between the two countries. And in the past few years, the US has tried to take also a more prominent role to kindly put varying degrees of success. So to kick it off, I'm going to ask Nora to give us a brief overview of where she thinks the dialogue currently is and where she think it's, thinks it's going, uh, primarily from the perspective of Kosovo. So over to you, Nora. Uh, thank you, Austin, and thank you to everyone. Um, well, it is important to say that Kosovo and Serbia, uh, they were in dialogue for the last 15 years, really. And also, the uh, US had a crucial role in all these years. Uh, we have to remember, uh, there was the Atisari mediated negotiations that took place in Vienna, which concluded in 2006 from where the so-called Atisari plan derived, a document which effectively concluded that Kosovo cannot go back to an autonomous prov province of Serbia after all the uh, atrocities that were committed on uh, the Alba Albanian civilians at the time. So this technically um, and practically led to the independence of Kosovo and the uh, declaration of independence. So since then, the EU took over uh, the mediated process between uh, Kosovo and Serbia. And there were merely uh, negotiations on technical issues. And these issues that were negotiated uh, constantly were uh, practical issues like uh, recognition of license plates uh, so that people could travel freely from uh, Kosovo to Serbia, uh, registrar, re return of birth certificate and regist registrars, which, which uh, the Serb army had taken when they left uh, Kosovo, when the NATO intervened. So it was really a matter of, of uh, civilized behavior, so to speak, with, with one another. And, and this was, I think, the core of failure of the European Union because uh, core issues such as at first acknowledging the war crimes committed by Serbia uh, during 98, 99, there are six mass grave sites around Serbia with the bodies of Albanians who were dumped after having had been transported as means to hide the traces of crime at the time. Uh, the issue of inter-ethnic cohabitation and reconciliation were not negotiated, and the killed Serb civilians after the war. So none of these issues were put on the table. And I do understand that at the time the EU really wanted to put the two parties together. And uh, obviously they thought the technical issues of some sort uh, would, would make that happen easier. And then that would lead to maybe other uh, core issues. So in, in reality, the EU-led negotiations were, were not successful. They were, uh, I would say, a monumental failure considering the amount of time and, and finances that they have put in it. It was sometimes mostly a PR for whomever, whomever led the negotiations. 
so in addition, the EU really did not have a traditional role of a mediator that tries to balance the act between the two parties around the table. The EU was more of a facilitator who told both parties what they should, or more importantly, what they cannot do. And so uh, at times very little pressure was put on Serbia, but much more pressure was put on Kosovo. And so there was a general sense of disbalance there. If we look at what's going on now, Serbia has really no interest to conclude a deal with Kosovo because it has in a sense nothing to lose. Uh, it doesn't have uh, effective control over the territory of Kosovo. So the main aim is really for Serbia to cause damage in a sense to prevent any progress for Kosovo in the national arena, such as lobbying against Kosovo's membership on international organizations such as UNESCO and, and the Interpol and actively lobbying against the uh, de-recognition of Kosovo uh, by more states, states around the world. So this, this is really happening uh, at the time. This was happening also before during the actual dialogue, uh, but at the same time, uh, it continues to happen also now. So Serbia uh, does not really want to engage in a constructive agreement, because what that would mean is that both countries would have to equally recognize one another. And in this sense, Serbia would have to recognize Kosovo as an independent state. And of course, Serbia does not want to do that. In a way, the question is, what does Serbia want? Uh, Serbia wants the territory of Kosovo, but it doesn't want the people that go with it. And can such a thing be negotiated? So uh, at the moment, as we speak, Serbia is being heavily armed by Russia and China, and it is allowing the region to witness that because they thank the two allies uh, publicly. Just a few days ago, another mass grave site was found with Albanian bodies. So this all brings a lot of complexities on the future of the dialogue. And I mean, this, these issues may be seen now as something that we can here talk about and analyze as histories between the two countries, but effectively, uh, they affect the people and the everyday life of people in both Kosovo and Serbia. When it comes to the US, during the Obama administration, the US had really kept aside and gave the lead to the EU, which was not good, I have to say at the time, uh, but at least there were no additional damages done directly by the US. Uh, with the most recent moves from the President Trump administration and his special envoy, Richard Grenell, now that was some sort of a real drama. I mean, things were, were, went kind of out of control. It was a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of Twitter battles be, through through Twitter between Richard Grenell and, and Kosovo leader, junior government officials, something that was not seen before and something which is also very dangerous because if you hear Trump saying that he stopped the 400 years battle between Serbs and Albanians, which then somehow magically also brought peace to the Middle East. I'm not quite sure where that connection came from. So these are extraordinary allegations and, and are not correct. And also for those that know the complexities in the Balkans, uh, they are also very dangerous. I mean, at the moment, uh, what, what needs to be done is uh, there has to be serious diplomacy. And I have to say the last time that there was serious uh, diplomacy and negotiations that happened, it was at the time when um, US late ambassador Richard Holbrook was actually negotiating uh, on behalf uh, to stop the war at the time. And, and that is something that is needed now. And to conclude my remarks, uh, this is, uh, we have to understand that Kosovo is such a small country. It is poor economically. This entire, everything is happening in a pandemic crisis with poor healthcare and a political crisis of this magnitude, uh, with the entire elite being in The Hague at the moment. And I have to say, it is impressive how, how Kosovo is actually surviving, to be frank. I would think that even, even Canada or, or Switzerland would collapse with all these issues at hand. So this is uh, what I would start with. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nori. You touched on a lot of really interesting topics. I'm sure going to dive more into a bit later. Um, Philip, I'd like to ask you a similar question, but from the from Serbia's perspective, where do you think the dialogue currently is the state of the dialogue, and where do you think it's going in the near term future? So you just speak on that for a few minutes. 
Thank you, Austin, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak about this issue, um, which is a burning issue, but uh, which has been burning issue for Serbia for the past uh, at least 20 years. Um, so uh, 20 years since the end of uh, the war, and almost a full decade since the EU-led negotiations have uh, started, Serbia and Kosovo made many steps forward, but unfortunately did not move much closer to the resolution of the conflict. Um, in 2013, in April, as you all know, uh, the Brussels agreement was signed. And at the time it was hailed as a historic agreement. Um, but unfortunately, this agreement remains only par partially implemented. And from the Serbian point of view, the most important provision of the Brussels agreement, which is the creation of the Association of Serbian Municipalities, has not been implemented by the Kosovo side. So from the Serbian point of view, um, Serbia uh, implemented its part of the deal, but Kosovo failed to implement its own part of the deal. And this is where basically the whole process uh, halted. Um, the dialogue in November 2018 reached a full still, uh, stalemate when Kosovo introduced tariffs on Serbian goods uh, in response to Belgrade's uh, de-recognition campaign, which Nora has just mentioned. Um, at the time, Presidents uh, Vucic and Taci also started toying and secret, secretly discussing um, uh, the idea of a land swap, uh, the idea which uh, was rejected not only by, uh, you know, Kosovo population or public opinion, also Serbian uh, opinion was quite skeptical of it, but most importantly by Germany and other European states which basically rejected the idea of uh, the exchange of territories. Um, then the U.S. administration under the, the President Donald Trump um, um, did not reject the land swap idea and according to some testimonies even uh, accepted it at some point, uh, but also pushed for economic normalization, uh, which was um, you know, crowned or which culminated in the Washington Agreement signed uh, on, November, on September the 4th. Uh, largely disconnected from the EU efforts uh, to, to reach the comprehensive deal. So where we are now, uh, on the positive side uh, of things, I would say that the EU facilitated dialogue resumed in July 2020, um, once a special representative of the EU, Miroslav Lajcak, uh, took office, but also tariffs uh, of um, Serbian goods uh, have been abolished. And the goal of this phase is obviously to reach a legally binding comprehensive agreement, uh, which will uh, put an end to this conflict. Uh, the new administration in Washington uh, will hopefully give wind in the sails of the EU effort. That's my prediction. I'd like to hear your view maybe later on on uh, the, the policies of the President-elect Biden. But I think that the, the key difference will be that the, um, that the US administration won't play a separate a game that would fully support uh, EU efforts. Uh, on the negative side, I would say that COVID-19 and the economic recovery, which uh, expects us, uh, uh, will take priority both in the Western Balkans and in the EU over uh, normalization of uh, relationship in Serbia and Kosovo. And also the EU doesn't have either incentives or interest, to be honest, to push for a quick resolution of this conflict because the quick resolution, although it is quite, uh, the chances are quite slim, the, the quick resolution would mean that both Serbia and Kosovo would be knocking on the doors of the EU for EU membership and uh, they're not ready and the EU is not ready, especially given the you know, uh, public opinion across the EU and the skepticism towards enlargement at this point. The government in Belgrade is rock solid uh, although it has problems with democratic legitimacy, I can talk about it later on, uh, but the government in Kosovo is not. Uh, and I think it's also one difficult uh, obstacle which will altogether uh, prevent uh, any quick solutions uh, in, in this phase of the dialogue. Sorry for being uh, a pessimist, but I think uh, that's my assessment. I, and I think it's, it's a, unfortunately a realistic assessment which doesn't bode well for, for quick, um, quick resolution, despite all those efforts and despite these transatlantic uh, joint efforts, which we can expect in the months ahead, I doubt there will be uh, quick and comprehensive uh, agreements.
including the neutral recognition. Thanks so much, Philip. That was really insightful. And once again, I'm sure we'll touch on more of those topics as we go on. Um, now I'd like to ask more specific questions. Uh, first, Nora, I'd love to hear your opinion on the recent political upheavals that happened in Kosovo, especially regarding uh, President Sashi's uh, resignation. And it seems like there's at least a chance of early elections in Kosovo being on the horizon. I'd love for you to speak to whether, A, you think new elections or early elections are going to happen, and B, what impact, if any, that might have on the dialogue process. Um, yes. Um, well, I mean, inevitably, there will have to be elections in, a, in the next six months. Um, so if they, they come earlier than that, than that, um, that is uh, entirely up to what's happening at the moment, generally speaking, with the pandemic and, and the coalitions um, in, in Kosovo. And the fact that uh, all of this happened in a, in a very um, abrupt kind of manner, all this sort of uh, uh, dragging the elite, the, the political elite, uh, almost in a, in a crowd really, in The Hague. And um, that of course also uh, is seen in Kosovo as a sort of blackmail on behalf of the e EU, uh, because uh, it was after all a court which was uh, decided in Kosovo and, and uh, actually founded in Kosovo by these very same people. And, and of course, there is also a sense of, of uh, really, again, a disbalance because uh, we have um, six mass grave sites in Serbia. At the moment, they are excavating more bodies just in the outskirts of Belgrade. And then you have um, these guys uh, in The Hague in a very secretive sort of court. Um, and nothing is very clear. They are not there for the, the reasons that they, um, legal reasons that they were thought to have gone to the organ trade, etc. cetera. Um, and I think uh, this will have a huge impact uh, on the dialogue, but also it will have a huge impact on, generally speaking, on um, uh, the international uh, transitional justice system, because uh, so far uh, it has been seen that the International Tribunal for the Crimes in Yugoslavia has not really succeeded. I mean, we have seen very few people being um, uh, tried, uh, and some of those people that were tried for the crimes uh, are sitting in the parliament of Serbia today. So. Um, it, it, is, it is a general sense of disbalance. And this has really a huge impact on how people are seeing the future and what is, going to the, future, what is the future going to bring. Um, so there is a lot of uncertainty because we have to remember Kosovo really relies on the support of the EU and the United States. Uh, so I think um, no matter what happens, the new elections will definitely um, uh, have an impact on the dialogue. And I think these issues of transitional justice will have um, a lead as opposed to, as I mentioned before, the technical issues which the negotiations at the, at the start, at the very start started with. Thanks so much, Nora. That was, that was really, really great. Um, now I'd like to turn to Philip. And Philip, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about uh, Serbian President Alexander Vucic. Um, first of all, I wonder if you could, I'm wondering if you could speak to the con his political context. And after Serbia's elections a few months ago, he his party wound up with an even tighter grip on on parliament. So I wonder if you could talk to uh, speak to the um, dynamics and his negotiation position uh, after that election and how his joint consolidation of power contrasted with. Uh, Kosovo's kind of political turmoil might create a sort of power imbalance uh, within the dialogue. So over to you, Philip. And thanks, Austin. Well, um, President Vucic is currently at the peak of his power. So from his point of view, I think from now on, uh, things can only go downhill. I mean, he's so powerful that no other politician in Serbia, even Milosevic didn't command such a huge control over every aspect uh, 
of politics, society, and media in Serbia as much as uh, President Vucic has at the moment. So he uh, won in the first round of presidential elections uh, with a landslide majority in 2017. So he will be president until 2022. Uh, in June this year, he uh, again won his political pa his party, Serbian Progressive Party, um, obtained 188 out of 250 seats in the Serbian parliament, uh, which means that they have a clear two-third majority they can form a government on their own. They can uh, change the constitution on their own. They did form a government with other parties in the parliament uh, just for the sake of legitimacy, but they're so powerful that they can rule uh, on their own. Uh, with 700,000 members, uh, which is 10% of the Serbian population, Serbian Progressive Party is one of the biggest in Europe uh, and uh, has more members than the League of Communists of Yugoslavia. Um, so he, his power is really at, at the peak at the moment. And he also controls all the media, all the TV stations with the national frequency are, uh, you know, parroting uh, Vucic's propaganda. He controls also the most of the, the, the press market. He controls also the, the Serbian politics in Kosovo. Recent, in recent local elections in uh, the Northern Mitrovica, uh, the candidate of the, of the Serb list, Srpska lista, won a whopping 89% of the vote. I don't think that even Saddam Hussein was winning with, with such a huge uh, majority. So it's, um, he, he has it all. Um, opposition is at its weakest point. Um, opposition is fragmented, uh, it's, uh, you know, disorganized, it doesn't be, it participate in, uh, in the parliament, they boycotted the election. In some, for Vucic, it can only go downhill. Uh, but uh, paradoxically, <clears throat> this uh, amassing of political power has also weakened his hand in terms of democratic legitimacy. Uh, as I said, elections, uh, parliamentary elections from uh, June this year um, have been boycotted by the opposition due to the absence of basic preconditions to be fair and free. So currently we don't have any opposition party in the parliament because he decided to form a government with two other parties, Socialist Party of Serbia and Patriotic Party. Uh, so all the parties basically which are currently present in the parliament are also a part of the coalition. Uh, we don't have opposition in the, in the parliament, which is a unique case, I think, uh, in Europe at the moment. Um, Serbia finally has been qualified by high, as, a, as a hybrid regime by Freedom House and by many other organizations which monitor and index uh, the level of democracy. And all this means that um, he has full legal and institutional power to conclude the deal with Pristina. However, the legitimacy uh, would be hotly contested uh, domestically, most importantly, and could bring about his political demise. All the public opinion polls show that uh, if he was to sign a deal with Kosovo and recognize Kosovo, his support and his electorate would be halved immediately, despite all the control that he has. So that's why I think uh, Alexander Vucic will do everything in his power to basically kick the can down the road as much as he can and not to cross the Rubicon, even at the peak of the power. Thanks so much, Phil. That was really, really insightful. And now I'd like to maybe turn a bit to the dialogue itself and try to first of all turn to Noor and ask her to think a little practically, what kind of realistic uh, deal do you, uh, do you think that the Kosovo's government and Kosovo citizens writ large would be able to support? Or does no such deal exist? The, such deal exists. I mean, Serbia needs to recognize Kosovo's independence, recognize Kosovo as a country. Uh, Kosovo is an independent country. It is it's a fact. So it will not go back to something else. It will not go back to a different status. And I think ultimately that's the only way that uh, any sort of progress between Serbia and Kosovo and the region for that matter will happen. 
So Kosovo uh, has to be recognized. Uh, Serbia has to recognize Kosovo. And as Philip says, it is unfortunate that uh, perhaps that is really not in the horizon, in, in the immediate horizon, knowing uh, current Vucic's Vucic power, but also knowing that he is, I mean, he was one of the uh, lead uh, collaborators of Milosevic. So he's sort of leading that legacy to this day. And I think there is no um, there is no other there is no other way other than to recognize Kosovo. And if both countries want to uh, enter within the European Union, um, I mean that has to happen. The fear is that uh, Kosovo um, has been under a lot of a tremendous amount of pressure from the EU and somewhat also from the US because uh, Serbia does uh, portray itself as a victim in the sense that they lost Kosovo and now they have to get something else. And they have succeeded so far in, in many of their requests, uh, like for example, in the, in the tax one. So that was the first time that Kosovo ever decided to actually put something to, to show a bit of a muscle against uh, Serbia. And, um, and that really sort of destabilized um, Serbia, perhaps not so much economically as much as it did to its, its pride, so to speak. And, uh, and so really, I think uh, there is no real democracy in Serbia in order for, for that democracy to comprehend that the only way forward for the region is actually to recognize Kosovo and to start cooperating, collaborating, and, and exchanging in a civilized democratic manner. And that would really bring prosperity also to the people in the country. I work with a lot of uh, uh, Serb, Serb professionals, civil society, um, who, are, who are worried about where the country's future is going. And, and unfortunately that whatever happens in Serbia in that sense, it does really affect Kosovo. And I think at some point, um, I think Kosovo will say, or will have to say, uh, you know what, we don't want to know. We don't need recognition from Serbia. We just need to move on. And there will be also for Kosovo, other means to move on and other allies to move on forward. So I think that is what's going to happen eventually with the course of things as they are going right now. Thanks so much, Nora. And uh, Philip, I'd like to ask you a similar question. Uh, what kind of realistic deal do you think that the Serbian government and the Serbian people will be able to accept? And does such a deal exist? And maybe you can also speak a little bit more to um, the political constraints or trade-offs that uh, Vucic would face in trying to reach such a deal. Sure. Well, let me first tackle the second question, second part of your question related to uh, political constraints that uh, Vucic would face in reaching a final agreement. I think that there are four major constraints. The first one is public opinion. Uh, and here I will draw upon the recent public opinion poll conducted by the Belgrade Center for Security Policy. You can read the full report uh, of the recent public opinion poll on our website. Um, while people generally support dialogue in Serbia, around 65% of uh, the Serbs uh, do so, around half, basically half of them don't believe that there will ever be an agreement. So 50% of, of the people in Serbia doubt that this whole process will ever lead to, to a, an agreement. Um, also, 50% of the people in Serbia don't know what is the goal of uh, Serbia in, in this dialogue with Kosovo. Only 8% um, are in favor of recognizing Kosovo in its current borders. And this is a figure which doesn't change much over the years. I think it has even gone down over the years, paradoxically. Uh, the land swap uh, idea uh, is also not very popular uh, among the Serbs uh, with the support of only 14.5%. If Vucic would recognize Kosovo, his electorate, as I stated earlier, would split into half. So he would immediately has a 50% uh, vote uh, less. Um, so that, that's one huge, huge obstacle for him. The second obstacle is the position of the church. Traditionally, the Serbian Orthodox Church has been uh, one of the main 
players which uh, propel this narrative of Kosovo as the Serbia's sacred space, the Holy Land, um, as, as Serbia, Kosovo as Serbia's Jerusalem, um, over which there can be no compromises. Uh, we don't have the time now to, to go into detail of the background and the reasons behind this, but uh, um, despite their differences and despite uh, the fact that there are various uh, factions within the church, they're all holding on to this narrative as Kosovo as the Serbian Jerusalem. Uh, the Serbian patriarch Irene uh, unfortunately passed um, away a few days ago uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, and there will be a new patriarch um, in probably in the next three months. But I doubt that whoever takes over uh, that the position of the church will change when it comes to, to Kosovo. The, the basic narrative uh, won't change. Um, the third constraint is the opposition. Opposition, as I said, is very weak. Um, and if there is only if there is one thing which unites the opposition at the moment, it's um, their opposition to the recognition of Kosovo and to the land swap uh, agreement. Uh, and finally, Russia. Russia is the fourth constraint. Um, and while Russia officially backs Belgrade and uh, stated on numerous occasions that uh, they will accept whatever Belgrade and Pristina mutually agree upon. Um, it is not in their interest to have this conflict um, resolved because this would mean the removal of their biggest leverage in the Western Balkans, which is the UN Security Council um, veto over the future state of, states of Kosovo. And also this um, resolution of the conflict would open doors of NATO and the EU for Serbian Kosovo, something which Moscow obviously wants to um, stop. So what kind of realistic agreement might Vucic find acceptable? I think uh, from his perspective and from the perspective of any politician who wants to win the election and stay in power is to get a deal which will not look like a na another national defeat and humiliation. Uh, we have to remember that uh, Alexander Vucic portrays himself as somebody who restored Serbian national dignity and pride after decades of uh, humiliation and defeats. Uh, and uh, he would have a really hard time selling to the Serbs uh, recognition. This would be seen as a, as a treason. So some sort of territorial concession, partition, land swap, I think would be something that um, he could live with and he could survive politically. Um, and, he, and with this, I will stop. Uh, there is one more idea which uh, used to be the dominant idea uh, in the early 2000s and later, but at the time, I don't think that uh, it holds water so much, is the fact that uh, Serbia might get EU membership in return for Kosovo. That was the you know, background theory of uh, the EU. Uh, and for a very long time, um, I think many politicians in Serbia subscribe to that, at least privately, if not publicly. But this has three obstacles and three reasons why this doesn't hold water any longer. And with this, I will finish. First of all, the EU cannot offer at the moment quick membership uh, to Kosovo and Serbia. The EU is not ready. The Serbia and Kosovo are not ready. And even once the, the accession treaty is signed and we are, there is a long way there, uh, 27 countries need to ratify it. Some of them maybe even in a referendum. So nobody can make that such, such an offer to Serbia. Uh, second obstacle is that uh, Serbia is making no progress whatsoever in negotiating its membership in chapters, the key chapters 23 and 24, uh, judicial reforms and the rule of law. There has been no progress and no new chapters have been opened um, in 2020 and uh, uh, this will probably remain so in the foreseeable future. And finally, the enthusiasm in Serbia for the EU membership is really eroding. According to the BCSP public opinion poll, only 42% support the EU membership. Well, 45% think it will never happen. Most importantly, 67% of uh, the respondents, and we think also the, the, of the electorate and of the people in Serbia, don't support EU membership if the price is the recognition of Kosovo going back to the, the, the constraint of the public opinion. So I think uh, currently there, there are very few realistic agreements in the cards, uh, but uh, some form of um, you know, uh, compromise, uh, which uh, will be sold to the Serbian public as 
um, the, 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 the deal which uh, respected Serbian national dignity and pride is the only thing that can survive politically. Thanks so much, Philip. That was all really, really insightful. Um, now to move on to our Q&A session, we've gone some, uh, several great questions from the audience. I'm trying to uh, pick ones that I think might fit each of your areas of expertise particularly well. Um, uh, for Nora, I would love, we have an audience member who's asked, uh, what are some good analogies to a possible resolution to the Kosovo Serbia dialogue? I know you've done plenty of research on various other peace and conflict situations. So I'm wondering if you have a scenario or two in mind that could almost be a model for Serbia and Kosovo to emulate. In, in, in many ways, actually, Kosovo is some sort of a sui generis case um, because it was an autonomous province within Serbia during the Yugoslav times. So it was effectively operating um, as an independent uh, place, uh, country, partially with some intervention from Serbia. I mean, that that all dissolved when sort of Milosevic decided to come to power and said, okay, not anymore. We, we will, as, as Philip said now, re, uh, restore the national pride of Serbia because that is always what it is about. So I work quite a lot in South Africa and I often made uh, comparisons as to whether a uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of a similar type would work uh, for uh, Kosovo and Serbia. And um, unfortunately, uh, if in order for any sort of um, uh, agreement or peace resolution between Serbia and Kosovo to work, uh, we have to, there is, a, there is a certain, I would call it a certain protocol of, of uh, in that process, you have to, Serbia really has to acknowledge the crimes that they have committed in, in um, 98, 99. There were, there were nearly over 10,000 civilians killed, um, over 10,000 women raped systematically. Um, I, I recently went and saw an exhibition of around 1,300 children who were murdered um, during this 1999, eight months to 15 years old. And uh, I mean, I think this would be really the first step, uh, Serbia's acknowledging these, these crimes would be the first step also to restoring um, the country's dignity, first of all. And, and I, I, um, I don't think that that is happening because I think there is a massive denial in Serbia that these things, these crimes have taken place, even though the bodies of these people are kind of in their backyard. They are in the outskirts of Belgrade and in other parts of Serbia. And it is obvious how these crimes uh, happen because it is obvious how these bodies went there. And for any sort of um, transitional, just successful transitional justice um, um, process to happen, every, all of these would have to be acknowledged, all of these crimes. And um, so I'm, I'm not sure um, if, if, in fact, many times when I thought, I don't think um, that um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, as it happened in South Africa, would actually succeed uh, in this case because there was no will and there isn't uh, still uh, from the side of the perpetrators to actually face uh, the past in that manner. I hope this answered the question. No, that was really great. Thank you so much. Um, Philip, I'd love to ask you a question that came in. Uh, you mentioned a little bit ago about Russia's role and how Russia's relationship with Serbia could complicate the dialogue. We have an audience member who would like to hear about China. And of course, China has been very active in Serbia economically in the past uh, a little over a decade or so. So I'm wondering if you think that China could be another foreign actor that might complicate the dialogue process or if China's interests lie elsewhere and it doesn't really care about the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue all that much? 
Sure. Thanks, Austin. But before I uh, return to this question, I'd like to respond to some of the things that Nora mentioned, uh, if you allow. Um, she's to an extent right that, uh, generally speaking, Serbian public lives in denial and doesn't want to accept the atrocities, not only in Kosovo, but uh, also in Bosnia. But uh, on the other hand, I must notice that in Serbia, there are many individuals and organizations which put themselves and their lives and their uh, reputations in harm's way over the past 20 years or so to repeat endlessly and tirelessly about the war and about the Serbian atrocities in the war. There are many of them. There are many Sonja Biserkos and Natasha Kandiches. But there are very few in Kosovo, I must uh, say, people who are also ready to take a look at uh, the violence which has been committed against the Serbs. I'm very often extremely frustrated with the fact that uh, even among the Kosovo liberal intelligentsia and the non-governmental sector, I don't find many people who are um, you know, as brave to, to openly challenge uh, the dominant narratives propelled by the KLA uh, about Kosovo as being the only victim in this war and about the, the war as the heroic resistance against the, 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 the onslaught of Milosevic's nationalist hordes. I will just uh, remind you that uh, since 1999, 100,000 people, Serbs, have been expelled or left Kosovo under pressure. Uh, and um, very few organizations and people in Kosovo are ready to, to face this and to talk about it, to talk about uh, the march violence and about the burning of churches and uh, uh, this destruction of property and graves. Uh, and it would be great if uh, liberals in, in Belgrade would have more allies in Pristina with whom we could together challenge the nationalist narratives of victimization. Yes, Kosovars were victims of, of the Serbian regime in the 1990s, but uh, we cannot deny that Serbs have been victims of the Kosovar uh, politics since 1999 and that they had been victims uh, in the 1980s, which is a cycle of violence which repeats. Whoever is in power is uh, victimizing and oppressing the other. We can go into history, we don't have the time here. So I think this, this narrative, the monopoly on, on victimhood needs to be uh, jointly tackled. And now to, to go back to the, the, the question about China. Yes, China is a growing actor in, in the region. It's, it's a growing uh, actor worldwide. Um, in Serbia, its uh, operations have been mostly economic, but recently through the Belt and Road Initiative, obviously, but recently uh, through the purchase of uh, Huawei uh, smart uh, cameras, uh, so-called smart city system, which was installed in Belgrade, um, through joint police patrols and other uh, instances, China is um, also increasing its uh, presence as, as a political and security actor, so to speak. But uh, when it comes to Kosovo, um, there, position uh, has not uh, changed significantly over the years, uh, despite their increased economic and political leverage. They're in principle uh, against the unilateral uh, declaration of independence of Kosovo, and they uh, support territorial integrity of Serbia, but did not really um, you, you know, do anything beyond that. They did not uh, um, uh, increase their leverage politically uh, as much as Russians did since 2008 and did not express that much uh, uh, of, of an interest to, to become an active player, more active player in the normalization dialogue. Um, Russia, on the other hand, has, uh, at least since uh, 2008 and the so-called energy deal, uh, been a, an active uh, player, if you want uh, a spoiler of the process. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, I think Russia in principle supports territorial integrity of Serbia, but uh, in practice uh, is, um, you know, after protection of its own national interest, it wants to uh, slow down uh, NATO and EU enlargement, and it, it wants to show to its uh, uh, own backyard, to countries such as Georgia and, and others, that um, EU and NATO integration is not necessarily a success story, but can also be 
part of the problem. Uh, but on the other hand, Russia doesn't have an alternative vision either for uh, belgrade pristina dialogue or for uh, the geopolitical future of the region. And I think they will put the clogs in the wheels of, of EU and NATO, but it, they won't um, they, they won't offer any alternatives to what uh, Brussels, EU, and NATO have to offer. Thanks so much, Philip. That, that's really interesting. And I think it is really going to be interesting to see how various foreign actors like kind of pivot themselves as this dialogue continues to have a position themselves vis-a-vis -vis Serbia and Kosovo. Um, another question for Nora. Nora is the one, as the panelist who's most plugged into to uh, Coast of our society has the most direct personal connections. I was wondering if you could answer this question about public opinion in Kosovo and kind of what your sense is. This person is specifically wondering if there is support solely for prosecutions in Kosovo amongst the Kosovo public, or if there might be uh, people who would be willing to trade peace for amnesty, essentially willing to trade um, not prosecuting war criminals in exchange for being recognized by Serbia and being further along the EU integration process? Um, well, I mean, as I said, any sort of process would be possible, uh, even a negotiation of amnesty, but then one has to have a partner to do that. And in this case, Kosovo and Serbia have to partner and decide what is the best way to move forward, whether you know, they will negotiate, whether they will give amnesty, whether they will prosecute some who, uh, some leaders and prosecute others or perpetrators. Um, so it is a matter of dialogue. And I think also what Philip said, it is extremely uh, important that it is important to recognize um, the victimhood of of in in general the, to to talk about that, but it, I mean the pain I know very well that also Serbs in Kosovo has suffered, and and there is no way to measure I suppose uh, pain and suffering, but we can only measure that in numbers, and um, and we have to also uh, remember that um, there was no Milosevic regime in Kosovo that uh, also Serb people were afraid of, so they had to obey it. Uh, no, as Serb people in Kosovo and in Serbia, they supported Milosevic in the idea of expelling Albanians from Kosovo. And I mean, that is also ongoing now. Um, and uh, I, I have to remind you, I was a, a teenager at the time, and I had to flee Kosovo because of the war. I was not allowed to go to high school because I was Albanian. I was not allowed, uh, my parents were kicked out of work because they were Albanian. And Kosovo's population was 90, is 90% Albanian. So the country functioned for some years uh, with, a, with a, a small percentage of Serbs. And, uh, and I work very closely actually with the civil society community in Belgrade in trying to balance out now for us, for the future generations, the narrative of war and to actually work, uh, work together. Because I think just as Philip mentioned, it is important that perhaps we can't influence the higher level of polit political structures but we, uh, the young, educated uh, people with open mind for the future, have to work together. But we have to work uh, openly and honestly. Uh, and there is also one thing that uh, is happening, which I, I work very closely at the moment in uh, analyzing the security and protection of the Serb Orthodox Church. And uh, I think that Serbs in Kosovo are also be kept hostage from the political structures in, in Serbia. And that is also unfair to them. Uh, so these are all these complexities as, as ever, <laughs> but also uh, that don't make life easier for any sort of uh, uh, reconciliation to happen and then move on uh, forward to, to enter the EU. But if, I mean, ultimately uh, any, any, anything would be possible if there would be a genuine will to engage in a dialogue. And as I said in the beginning, I mean, Serbia really has no interest to do that. So 
not to not to uh, extend more. Thanks so much, Nora. Um, Philip, I have uh, one more question for you from a from an uh, audience member. Um, for your perspective, do you think there's any chance that let's let's say there is some sort of deal between Serbia and Kosovo in which certain that entails mutual recognition uh, and eventually EU membership for both for both countries? Could that potentially embolden other kind of would be secessionist movements in other countries throughout the world? I'm thinking in terms of if Kosovo is successful and gave recognized by Serbia, could that embolden uh, the Catalonian potential uh, Catalonian nationalists in Spain or the situation in uh, Moldova with Transnistria, Sepulcetia, Abkhazia, and Georgia, and so on and so forth? Do you think that's a very real concern that uh, that really is pretty the West should be should be worried about when working with this dialogue? Or do you think the uh, Kosovo-Serbia normalization can be contained as kind of a one-off scenario and not set this kind of chain reaction for other secession movements throughout, throughout the world? This is for me, right, Austin? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, sorry, that, that, was, um, that was gonna be for Philip. Okay. I'm sure, but if you want to jump in, you're of course more than welcome to. Well, I won't take long, so Nora, feel free to jump in. Um, I think um, there is a case to be made that this uh, is a sui generis, uh, you know, secession. Uh, you can always construct arguments how it's totally different from other cases. In Catalonia, there was no uh, war comparable to the one which we had here and it has different history administratively, politically, so on and so forth. And yes, you could make this argument and there are many people who do it, make it. But uh, practically, um, secessionists in, in Spain or in uh, other countries uh, uh, won't um, be convinced. They will certainly take this as, uh, you know, another confirmation that uh, their secessionist struggle is uh, worth pursuing and that, uh, you know, here we have a case of a successful secession which uh, ended with uh, uh, an agreement and with a confirmation of the um, host state or mother state uh, with the secession. I mean, every precedent started as a sui generis case. In order to have a precedent, you need first to have a sui generis, you have to, it has to happen once. Um, and uh, this is, I think, a real concern. Whether this would immediately, uh, you know, start uh, secessionist wards and it, whether it would open Pandora, Pandora's box, no. But uh, this is, uh, those secessionists that you mentioned and in other parts of uh, the world in Africa too, would certainly be looking at what is going on here and would uh, use this as yet another argument in favor of their struggle. As was the case basically in um, you know, Ukraine, it was the case in, in, in Georgia, it's the case in Nagorno-Karabakh, and it's the case in Catalonia. These people are making those comparisons and are uh, pointing to the Kosovar case as uh, a sort of precedent that should be followed. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Nora, would you like to also uh, jump in that question for a minute and give your perspective? Uh, no, I think I agree with uh, with Philip actually. Um, so, but I mean, yes, there there would Kosovo is a great example if somebody wants to use it against in case of Catalonia. But again, it was it is not a similar scenario, and it happened also. Uh, we cannot forget it happened. So Kosovo is like the last puzzle of of the whole fall of Yugoslavia. So um, uh, it is a different political and social context in that sense. Uh, uh, thank you so much. That, uh, that was that was really great, and it really is interesting to think about. Just because, objectively speaking, Kosovo is an exceptionally unique case because it endured genocidal acts from Serbia, which which these other cases can't claim to do. It doesn't mean that they won't try. So, um, and I think uh, I think just briefly, it, it would be helpful to think about how a new uh, U.S. administration, the Biden administration, may. Uh, kind of transition away from certain administrations 
uh, kind of attitude and way that that he approached the Serbo-Kosovo dialogue, whereas the Trump administration really tried to create this kind of di uh, bifurcation between economic and political matters, and the U.S. would deal with the economics, and the EU with the politics. I really don't think that's the route that President like Biden is going to take. I think he's a committed transatlanticist that will be looking to work closely with the EU. But as Philip rightfully alluded to earlier, um, there definitely are worries that this won't be at the top priority of the, of the Biden administration. It might kind of just be left to the EU to pick up the slack like in years past with, which uh, Nora, as you said earlier, hasn't always worked out for Serbia or Kosovo. So that's definitely a thing to be mindful about and keep our eye on. And uh, with that, I'll turn over to Mike Horowitz for some closing remarks. Hey there, this has been a, a really fascinating conversation and thanks so much uh, Austin, Nora and Philip for, for sharing those insights and taking the time to join us for this, uh, th this event today. And thanks everybody in the audience for joining us and we hope to see you next week for our final uh, The World Today of the Semester, A Law Not War from the Nuremberg Trials to Today, featuring the last, last living prosecutor from the Nuremberg Trials, uh, Ben Ferenc and Perry Worldhouse's Professor of Practice of Law and Human Rights and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Rad Al Hussein. As always, you can find, you can access this recording on our YouTube channel and find out all about our other upcoming events by joining our mailing list and following us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. We're at Perry Worldhouse. We will drop links to all of that in the chat as well. Uh, thanks all again for a really fascinating conversation about the ongoing developments between Serbia and Kosovo. And I hope everybody uh, stays safe out there. Uh, have a great day.